Bonjour, Brett. Bonjour, Drew. How are you doing today? Très bien. Very good. I don't speak French. No, we're going to do it in English. Do not worry. Uh, we're very excited and honored to have you both here. We're at Cybos 2019. I believe the biggest, the largest Cybos ever. It is. Ten, over 10,000 people. 10,000 people in London, so it's very convenient for us being based here. Again, thank you for your time. Uh, Brett, you travel all the time. You had some uh, health issues which were well, quite nasty recently. It was, nasty a, it was an ear problem. I'm, I'm coming good. And you still overcame that to make it for us, probably not just for us, but we're grateful. Um, and Drew as well, so thank you for joining. No just quick, uh, I'll make the introductions very quickly. So Drew, you've worked for a couple of banks uh, in fintech. Um, you spent some time in Asia, so in Hong Kong and Singapore, I believe. Most of my life, yeah. Most of your life even. So now you work at Barclays. Indeed. Which is unarguably one of the most innovative or, or keen banks to push meaningful innovation to the market. Mm. Uh, Ashok Basbani, one of the b best leaders uh, in the industry, okay. and you work, I believe, for Megan K. I work with Megan, exactly. And well, Brett? Good. Yes, yeah. Megan's great, Very good. she's the reason I'm there. ex styling as well, right? Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Megan is awesome. And, um, and Brett, I don't even have to introduce you, but you're like but a- go ahead anyway. <laughs> I'm gonna try. Um, Best-selling author, uh, radio host of probably the most popular radio show in the world in fintech and banking innovation. Correct. So far, Breaking so good. Banks. Breaking banks. Um, <laughs> you're also like a founder of a company which is trying to revolutionize as well the user experience in banking. So moving. We were the first mobile first challenger in the space. So. And if we had more time, we could talk about specific features you introduced years ago than current banks are like yes. <laughs> seeing as amazing innovation in 2019. Uh, and you're also, of course, probably the most visible, trusted, well-known influencer in the industry globally. So influencers, right? We could even spend hours just debating the definition of influencers. But Drew, mm. can you please uh, share your views on uh, FinTech influencers, their impact on the market and their credibility mm. as well? Yeah, sure. This, this, this came about from a conversation I had with an ex-colleague of mine uh, who was talking about your latest book. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Um, who was asking that this book be read by everybody in their department. Uh, which I love when that I hear stories like so that. So do I. It's great. But it did lead to a conversation around the importance of context when it comes to the concept of influence and thought leadership. Mm. So you talk a bit about what the end state of this market looks like. We don't need banks anymore. Which leads to a situation where there is a lack of homogeneity, where we have kind of a balkanization of different banks with different business models serving different needs for different consumers. In that world, doesn't the role of the influencer or the thought leader also need to take into context all of these individual contexts that people are going through? How can a book that you write for the CEO of a global bank be the same that's needed for the head of innovation of a small fintech in Asia? How do you bridge those two together? So, you know, the, when I started the, the books, Bank to Zero in particular, it was written for the frustrated innovator in the bank trying to you know, get transformation happening. And so that has continued to be a core, um, you know, a, a driver for me personally, is giving tools to innovators within banks to get stuff done. Mm. Because ultimately the best thing for consumers is an ecosystem that ends up with, whether it's fintechs who have matured and ha have grown into unicorns or, or um, you know, big brands in their own right, um, fintechs and tech giants are surfacing, uh, you know, banking utility in, in their technology layers. This ecosystem that, that eventuates should be a great solution for customers. Now, if you're an incumbent operating in that environment, or you're a, uh, you know, a fintech innovator, mm. your objective should really be the same, which is do the best job you can for customers. And at the heart of that is things like removing friction from day-to-day -day customer experience or understanding when and where customers need to use banking mm. and making sure that your solution set um, is, you know, gets that behavioral context. So those are the things I wrote about. They could be applied to whether you're a fintech innovator or wh whether you are an incumbent. But of course, the other part of the discussion is um, where have fintechs got advantages, mm -hmm. where have banks got advantages, where can they work together, um, and then what's changing the whole landscape. And so that was also, you know, I, I, I endeavoured to sort of try and get into those elements. 
So one of the reasons I focused at the start on the Chinese ecosystem is because you've had such dramatic changes there. And it is telescoping the changes we're going to have in other markets where the role of the tech giants, in this case Alibaba and Tencent, have been so significant in terms of the way they've changed the trajectory of customer expectations in respect to banking day to day. Mm. And so that was really how it got started. And then I went down sort of the first principles engineering route, which was sort of a design premise. Mm. Um, but actually the thing that probably most people talk to me about um, is that this graph I've got at the end of the book, which shows the, the, the progression of bank 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 and 4.0. And I put it on a simple axis. Um, physical distribution to digital distribution on one axis and then high friction, you know, uh, high customer load, high compliance load engagements at one end, you know, in the old days to now low friction, low latency engagement. Mm. And so you, when you lay it out like that and you see progressively where the internet and mobile and now artificial intelligence and smart glasses and voice based, you know, uh, personal assistance and all of those things fit in. You, you see it as a trajectory and that you see then that the need for innovation is absolute because there will come a point where a bank 1.0 or even a bank 2.0 model, mm. you, you can simply not survive in the world that's emerging. And this works in some geographies more than the others. So the emerging econ economies of Asia, which is where I spent most of my time running fintech companies, they just land in this fourth stage straight away. There is no physical distribution apart from the whole cash smashing with digital. So the need for this innovation is absolute, but it is also um, existing within a stage of itself. Yes. And when you take incumbent banks in this part of the world, as in the Asian part of the world who are looking at it, they're looking at uh, Gojek, GoPay, Grab in kind of Southeast Asia versus people in the US, where you've spent quite a bit of time as well, who look very differently at what that context is for what innovation looks like. But as an author, as a thought leader, you have to write something that works for both. What's your responsibility of making sure that that's taken in the right context? Because if you're sat in America yes. as an incumbent of a tier two, tier three community bank, what good looks like is very different from if you're running a uh, incumbent bank in Hong Kong at the moment, Absolutely. as an example. But you've got to write a book that works for both. And, and that's always tough. I, I guess I've got the advantage in that I, I visit 30 countries a year as a thought leader speaker, you know, on the speaking circuit. Um, and so I get to see on the ground a lot of this stuff happening. You know, I'll get to Singapore and Hong Kong and Shenzhen and mm. uh, maybe Hangzhou in a year, but I'll also be in Europe. I'll be in the US. Uh, I'll get to Africa. So that does give me a sort of a global perspective. But, uh, you know, in, in the book, I'm pretty critical, actually, of, of the US in terms of their lack of innovation. But I try to get at why that is, you know, um, their, um, the regu regulatory environment they've got, which is sort of hard coded in behavior of banks. And that's very hard to shift. But in terms of your, your real question is the responsibility for me. All, all I could do was say, look, this is the global landscape. You know, and if you look at a 30,000 foot view, this is where the biggest changes are taking place. And if you look at that as a potential for change, mm. then we've got to assume that other markets are going to go through similar changes. That's predicated in the concept of eventual homogeneity of and financial services. But the world's going the other way. We're moving into heterogeneous financial services. We have the US that's going slowly to be charitable. We have Europe and the UK that's going in one direction. We have Asia that's going in another direction. And we have Africa that's going in another direction altogether. So when you have the world going through this balkanization of financial services, combined with this growing nationalism, which is just going to make that worse, how do you, and I'm including myself in this a little bit, but our roles are as a thought leader, are, are, you know, David and Goliath, to be honest, when it comes down to it. But I struggle with this idea that I spend time in one country and then in another country where I have to be able to make sure that everything I know is contextualized for the person that's doing it. Yes. But if you're writing a book, that's a unilateral channel. You yes. need to be able to contextualize for multiple people and a growing number of important people without being able to have the feedback loop that I can because I'm in the room. 
And this, I think, is driven by what we consider to be our moral responsibility for what this future looks like. Like, are you on yeah, the side that. of the incumbent? Are you on the side of the disruptor? Are you on the side of the consumer? And that then dictates how you want people to take your stuff and apply that to their context. Yeah, so different people reading my book would probably answer that in different ways. Mm. You know, fintechs would say he's a champion of fintech. Incumbents would say he's shown us the way that we can survive this. Um, you know, and, and customers would clearly say he's giving me the gamut of you know, potential outcomes here. I, I, I disagree with you in one respect, right, which is um, Everywhere I go, you see the same sorts of behavior on mobile. People taking selfies, people updating social media, people you know, um, engaged in experiences led by technology. Mm. And so the one thing that is consistent, whether you're on the Chinese version of the internet using Tencent WeChat Pay to pay for your groceries, or you know, whether you're in Kenya using M-Pesa on you know, a, a SIM card platform, this technology layer we've built is increasingly how we will assess experiences, mm. how we will expect or uh, access the available utility of the banking and financial services system. So increasingly, my view is that technology frames those experiences. So there may be some market differences, mm. But it's those broad technology changes which are changing consumer behavior and hence expectations. The two examples you gave, the using the selfies, uploading stuff into social media, both of them are starting from a position of a technological platform. Facebook is universal across the world. The camera as a platform is universal across the world. Money is inherently cultural and it's inherently localized. Finance as a platform is completely localized versus the technology platforms you're talking about before. I don't necessarily agree that we're going to end up, or we even are starting from a place of this idea that technology is the platform. People don't think of interacting with their money as a technological thing. They think of it as an emotional, a social, and a cultural thing. How do you bridge these two things together? This is a very philosophical <laughs> This <laughs> is what is. I wanted to get into. If I can step in, actually, mm. uh, first of all... I do <laughs> have an answer, but let's, let's uh, hear Christoph. First of all, <laughs> it's a fascinating conversation from where I sit. So I, I, I believe the viewers, we, we love that conversation. Uh, but Brett, first of all, in terms of influencers, you know, as far as it goes, you're different as well because you built a platform. So you've got that relationship, not only and that view, not only from a fintech and, standpoint. And, we, and we're a challenger collaboration. and we collaborate with banks. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's uh, that <laughs> that's one thing which needs to be said again. Uh, and second, I totally understand your point, you know, from where I'm from, I'm not working for a big bank, right? At the same time, then, that would almost like question the very the very mean of communication or channel that, that the book is. Then the idea would be to be very incremental or uh, to, be, uh, to be able to answer the needs or adapt your speech or your, 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 your thinking to specific areas of the world, you would need a, almost a mean of distribution different from a book. You need to, be, uh, to have a virtual breadth actually, like talking about specific topics at the local level. So I, I don't really see from where I sit how breadth could today, uh, please you will answer, provide that level of um, of uh, not sophistication, for lack of better words, but localization, which is extremely important. I agree with you. The only way I've found that possible is like when I actually go and speak to different audiences, and I can customize the message for them and and give that. But I'll I'll step you back one step even further from the technology thing, and so you break it down. And this is whether whether you are a farmer in Nigeria or a you know, stock trader working here in London. Do they still have stock traders? They're mostly automated now. Let's say a, uh, I don't know, a... Um, the London Metal Exchange, I was reading about it at the weekend. They still do are you commodities? Trading. You're a yeah. commodities trader in London, or, 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 or you know, you're, you're some, someone working down at Tesco's in, in, in London, um, or you're um, a, a developer in Shenzhen in China. What does a bank do for you? Um, and there's three core things that don't change no matter where you are in the world. The ability to safely store money, mm -hmm. the ability to safely move money, mm -hmm. and the ability to access credit. Now what's happening is 
regardless of where you are in the world, those three core pieces of utility are being reframed through technology. So what you're having is you're stripping away those long held conventions around products that we physically distributed mm -hmm. through a branch mechanism. And you're seeing the utility of value stores, the utility of moving money, the utility of credit being changed as a result of how easy it is to get access to it through, through a phone. So that's how I actually started off chapter one. I talked about first principles in engineering and I said, these are the three core things that every bank should do for its customers. And that is at the heart of what's changing. So if you want to, if you want to sort of express it in a very simplistic manner, regardless of whichever market you're moving from, the, the shift to the tech layer at the front moves you from physical distribution to digital distribution. And that friction stuff I talked about, what you're really talking about is moving from a product structure that was built for distribution through physical branches to now reframing those three core pieces of utility through technology-based experiences. Now there's different levels of sophistication and uh, um, you know, innovation when it comes to separate markets, but that trajectory or you know that that vision of where we're going is essentially the same the world over. I'll buy that. Um, Great. Okay. There we are. That's how you. <laughs> I told you. We reached a consensus. <laughs> that feels good. I'm, I'm pleased by that. So maybe like uh, one of the later, uh, last questions. Uh, do you think you've got a, as an influencer again, you've got a lot of influence, well, especially at your level. I think uh, nobody can argue uh, against that. Uh, which kind of responsibility do you have which we didn't really touch that but uh, in terms of social responsibility yeah. of the ability because you can influence banks right at your no, level but i think that comes to to your point you were talking about you know what is my responsibility as an influencer in this ecosystem with great power comes mm, great responsibility <laughs> maybe there's a rephrasing of it you as a futurist you write about the future and you have a uh, robust working theory about what that future looks like but you also must have, therefore, a robust theory about what the role of the thought leader or the influence is in this future. Right. And so when you look at the future, you will have to come up with a range of possible futures. So right now we're dealing with some massive issues on a global basis, right? Globalism, nationalism, the populist movement, climate change, artificial intelligence and its impact on employment, you know, all of these things that are emerging. So if you look at the range of possible futures, you've got, you know, utopian and dystopian, somewhere in between. Um, and so this is sort of the landscape as a futurist that you work with. And so you're trying to look at human behavior in the past, lessons from the past, and trends that are emerging that will take us down certain paths. Now, as a futurist, you can do two, two approaches to this. You can be completely agnostic to change and just say, this is how things could end up. Um, I tend to be an optimist, like someone like Bill Gates, mm. who says, technology can solve the big problems of the world if only we could get our collective selves together socially and agree on a way forward. And most of the time, that, that lack of consensus is what really hurts us as humans. And um, you know, if we, we had a more planned, collaborative structure to this. And so as an influencer, what I'm trying to do is create momentum, positive momentum, mm. optimistic momentum behind changes for good. But that's because I'm generally a techno-optimist. I don't know, you know, that's the way I approach it, Christoph. Um, I feel, I get energized by this stuff. I, you know, you, you, you've known me for a long time. You, you know, I couldn't be doing this stuff, going to 30 countries a year, writing books, running, moving, you know, doing the radio show, doing all the stuff unless I was really enthusiastic and energetic about it. And so that will to change things for the better is a, is a core driver for me personally as an influencer. Whether, you know, like when, when you said you had some guy in the bank and he says, we've got to buy everyone a copy of this book. For me, um, I'm doing my job if I hear that sort of thing. You know, I'm, I'm at, look, 
at, at the worst case, even if I'm wrong about all the stuff I say as a futurist, if my predictions are wrong, and fortunately I've been reasonably good with my track record on it, but even if I'm completely wrong, at least I've got the conversation started. And that's really, I think, what is a, is a core role that I have as an influencer. You might call it an agitator, but it's really to get people talking. And if people disagree with me, I'm absolutely fine with that. At least they're talking about it and doing something about it. And I think that's a good uh, way to wrap up the conversation. Uh, by the way, there's a great uh, documentary on Netflix, which is inside Bill Gates. Uh, it's head. wonderful. Did you, it's I just amazing. watched it last night. Well, I watched the, fir watched the first episode. Yeah, there's and, two uh, actually. One, uh, yeah, uh, fantastic. Is, is battle against polio, and the, the other one is, uh, yeah, the, like is the life as CEO. Yeah, the stuff, like why we need better toilets for the developing world. It's so simple, but yeah. You see the energy and the commitment and uh, what a brilliant mind as well. And by the way, uh, what's the latest status on your Netflix uh, sci-fi? Still working on it. But uh, that's why I saw Brian Cox today. Oh, you did? Is I'm trying to get him involved in it. So. That's for another conversation, but maybe yeah. next time we'll see a uh, Brett King producer yeah. as well of the Netflix <laughs> successful Netflix uh, sci-fi movie. Um, thank you very much both for your time. I know it's very busy at Cybo, so we're at the FinTech Power 50. Again, we are delighted and honored to have you. And thank you, uh, Drew, for suggesting that conversation like uh, about uh, the role and the importance he of FinTech influencers. So thank I think you. it's pretty fresh. Good so thank you very much, guys. Thank, thank you. Very thank